Hello and welcome to the Doof Book Club, our monthly live stream discussion of a book chosen by you, our listeners. My name is Matt Freeman, and I'm joined as always by a nearly perfect approximation of my co-host, Scott Daly. I'm practically perfect in every way. I don't remember what that's from, but that's a quote from something. Uh, I think it's Mary Poppins. I think you're right. I made some modifications to make you more kind of in line with kind of, you know, what what I wanted. Um, Which is like a huge fan of Mary Poppins, right? That's right. Yeah. Hello, everyone. I uh, hope you're having a wonderful Friday evening. Uh, I see tons of people in the chat that we already know, but if you are joining us for the very first time, hello. Uh, I am Scott, that is Matt, and we are Doof Media, or at least part of Doof Media, and we make podcasts all about the stories we love. We also arrange, organize, and lead this here monthly book club that you are attending right this very second. Matt, um, some people don't know what a book club is. What is what is a, a book club, at least in the of the Doof variety? Well, this specific variety is that each month, Scott and I select five books from a pool submitted to us by our wonderful Doof community. We put up a poll for all the supporters on Patreon at patreon.com slash doofmedia, and then we let them vote on which they'd like us to talk about. The book with the most votes wins, and then we all read it together. That is true. And then we all meet up right here, right now on the last Friday of the month and spend an hour or two discussing the book. We try to pull some slides of some interesting moments and really try to dive deep into this thing and figure out why we liked it or or why we didn't. Um, we see a bunch of people in the chat. So hello, everyone. We see David. We see John. We see Not Not. Tringard is here. Chris is here as well. Who else is here, Matt? Um, Medtathulu. Um that's, I like that's... how you read that as if you've never heard that person's name before ever in your entire life, even though they're here every month for book club. Nandy. You do. I was great. trying. I was trying to read two things at once, Scott. You're doing great. You're doing Hard great. To do. I, I kind of threw it to you without any warning, so it's it's fair. Well, I uh, didn't know which ones you had already said, so that because you're not paying attention to me, Matt. That's our problem. Oh you don't listen to me. You're right. That's the theme of the <laughs> conversation. We also have Jay here, by the way. Also, Bishop is here, um, and and Kyrgyzstan is here. All as right. Well. Nice. Well, yeah. Good to see everybody. Yeah. Good uh, to see everyone. Um, before we get into this month's book, let's talk about next month briefly. So I put up a straw poll at the very beginning of the book club, but I'm going to put it up again. No, not the results, Scott. Just the poll itself. There you go. Um, and so for those that don't know, we vote on what the books are every month on our Patreon, but we also have a special bonus vote for those people that attend the book club live, which means you all right now, while you're sitting here, get to vote twice if you're a patron, um, and you will help determine what our next month's book is going to be. So click on that poll. You get to pick two of those five and uh, we will take the votes from this poll, add it to the current votes from our Patreon, which are right here. Um, and then we will see which book we're going to be doing next month. Absolutely. Um, and uh, so that's your incentive for actually showing up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There you go. Incentivized. All right, Matt, what book are we talking about this month? We're talking about The Emperor's Soul by Brendan Sanderson. And the summary is as follows. A heretic thief is the empire's only hope in this fascinating tale that inhibit, inhabits the same world as the popular novel Elantris. I didn't know that. <laughs> Shy is a forger, a foreigner who can flawlessly copy and recreate any item by rewriting its history with skillful magic. Condemned to death after trying to steal the emperor's scepter, she is given the opportunity to save herself. Through her skill as a forger, though her skill as a forger is considered an abomination by her captors, Shy will attempt to create a new soul for the emperor who is almost dead. Probing deeply into his life, she discovers Emperor Ashravan's truest nature and the opportunity to exploit it. Her only possible ally is one who is truly loyal to the Emperor, but Counselor Gautana must overcome his prejudices to understand that Shai's forgery is as much artistry as it is deception. I was really relying on you to know how to pronounce these names, Matt, so you've, you've instilled in me some, some concern. Well, you know, it, 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 the first time you see it written down, it's always a bit jarring, but yeah. uh, I'll get there. Like, for example, the word phlegm? Man, that, that's yeah. one. Let that me is, tell you, folks. But... Uh, well, I don't. What what does that mean? What is that? What is that word? I said, yeah. on Kingslingers, I said Fledgem, and I meant I meant Flem, and seven thousand people made me pay for it, and will continue to make me pay for it for the rest of my life. Yep, I'm a little I'm a little sore about it right now. Yep. All right, so the Emperor's Soul 
Um, Matt is about to tell us what he thinks of this book before we get into the details. And while Matt is doing that, we want you in the chat to do the same thing. What did you think about this book? Did you read it for the first time for the book club? Or is this one of your old favorites that you have read and reread multiple times? And uh, what do you like about it? Matt, you go. Um, an enjoyable little book. It was interesting watching Sanderson write something short. Um, I, I, I think it's hard for him. You can kind of feel him like straining, like, like he's, you know, he's like the Hulk and he's like hulking out and he's like bursting out of his clothes, you know, um, with the, the clothes and the metaphor being like the form of a short story. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, I think it has a lot of the stuff that is good about Sanderson stories in general. It has, you know, a, an interesting protagonist. It has a complicated uh, kind of fun to think about magic system. Um, there's a little bit of intrigue, you know, it, it's, it's sort of, I, I think maybe in terms of, in terms of flaws, it's like, it tries to do everything that Sanderson does, except in a tiny little package. And I'm like, well, I don't know if that works. I think it would have been better if he had left some of these things out and focused more, like maybe removed like the big action scene at the end and just had it be like a, a quiet sort of, sort of literary story. Um, but uh, but that doesn't mean I didn't enjoy the story. That just means that I have opinions about maybe what could have been changed. And that's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, what did you think, Scott? We got to stop doing Brandon Sanderson for the book club, Matt. Because uh, I feel <laughs> so bad every single time I come to one of these episodes. I uh -huh. feel so bad because I want to love these books so much. And I just don't. I, I, I didn't. I think, honestly, I think I like this book less than you did, which is surprising because it's normally the exact opposite. This book really didn't do a lot for me, um, which is not to say that there's not a lot to talk about and, and not to say that it is not a, a good story. I think it's I think it's fine. I think it's it was a very quick read. I basically read it in two settings um, and it's very fine. I just mm -hmm. I it never really it never really got me. Um, and, and I look forward to really explore exploring and analyzing why that was. But uh, yeah, no, I just I feel <laughs> I feel bad coming to these shows Sanderson after Sanderson and being like, eh. <laughs> yeah, sometimes, sometimes he does get us, you know, sometimes yeah. there are a couple in there that, that I feel like, like they worked on us. But, um, this, this is one where, uh, it, it, it's very, you know, it's, it's just a, it's just a small story. And I think a lot of it is, I think the book should have been shorter if anything, like it's, it's, <laughs> it's in a weird place for me where it's like, you could feel that he he try, you know, it it's a story that wanted to be another six hundred page Sanderson epic, mm. but really needed to be like an actual short story, like not even a novella. Like it should have been a should have been a short story, right? Yeah. Um, really pared down because th there there is a cool concept in there. Like that's why I'm not I'm not like rag I'm not be, I'm not being totally negative here. Like. There's a cool concept. There's a few cool concepts. There's like a cool magic system. There's an interesting kind of theme, which we're I think we're going to talk about this this idea about like the magic system and, and you know forging copying a thing, but you have to understand its nature in order to copy it. And understanding its nature means understanding its history. Like there's a lot of there's a lot of layers to that. Um, I don't know that those layers needed to involve having a kung fu fight with skeletons. <laughs> and, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, like okay. I, there's a lot of people in chat. Some people are talking about how they absolutely love this book. It's one of their favorite books ever. I just want to say here at the top, that's I am not, I am not yucking your yum at all. Like I am, I wish I loved this book. Like that's that's where I feel like with um, with Sanderson is like I feel like there's an invisible wall between me and the people that love him, and I'm banging on it. I'm saying please, please God, let me in. Um, and I just it's 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 indestructible. I've I've tried so many times. Um, but. I, I like what you said about this book feeling like – and I, look, I didn't do any research into like whether Sanderson specifically set out here to write a short story specifically where he said, I am not going to write a long book. I am going to write a novella. It is going to be short, and I am going to keep it short no matter what. But that is what it felt like to me for sure. It felt like – He's he's really in every moment pushing against his natural tendency to sprawl out with a lot of this stuff and to take a lot of time on it. It felt really weird to me. I guess <clears throat> I think you're so right that there's so many different things going on in, in a very small package that I just over and over again felt like 
each individual one didn't get enough attention. Like the actual crafting of the Emperor's soul, I feel got a relatively few amount of pages. Like the the work she was having to do and like learn. Like I, I expected this to be a book where we'd learn a lot more about him, but I felt like we got the abridged version of who the Emperor was. Um, mm-hmm. I expected this to be a book a lot more about uh, her relationship with uh, the guy Gautana. Uh, Gautana. Um, obviously, that relationship is one of the key ones of the book, but it felt like we got an, a, a fast-forwarded version of that thing. And I'm not saying, oh, if this had been 600 pages, it would have been better. I don't, I don't know. That, that book doesn't exist. But it just felt like we were pushing up against the limit of 150 pages over and over and over again um, to, yeah. the, to the story's detriment. Yeah, now that you say that, I feel like the the short story version of this of this story would have been literally just a sequence of meetings with her and Galtana where she does the thing where she tries out the different seals on him and we thereby learn more about him and Galtana, mm-hmm. uh, him being the emperor and and then of course her and like there's so much there's so much rich thematic stuff you can play with in just those scenes alone. Yeah. Like you can, you can bring a lot of the other kind of extraneous stuff where it's like, and I call it extraneous, but it's, it's, it's stuff where like, you know, she, she, she makes her wall into like a mural or whatever, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. She makes her, she makes her window a stained glass window and it's like, that's cool. But I feel like that should have been like integrated into what I see as like the main story. And that's, that's what you were saying about the sprawl. Um, yeah, yeah. That's that's the kind of um, this is one of my I, we're coming out swinging, man. This is one of my criticisms <laughs> about Sanderson is like the the authors that I think are are like my favorites. They're usually doing like three to five things with every moment in the story, and Sanderson he he can do that. He absolutely can do that. Yeah, we saw it's, that in Warbreaker at we, times. We saw yeah. that. That's a good point. That, that that's one that kind of caught me off, caught me off guard with how clever it really was. Mm-hmm. Um, but then there are books where it really like there's like a whole scene, and it, the point is just like to show that this guy is mad at that guy, and like there's just not there's just not a lot of subtext to it. There's not a lot of it, it's kind of repetitive, and that's what happens with giant sprawling books in general anyway. So like that's just kind of it's kind of the name of the game. So you can al- yeah. you almost can't almost can hardly hold it against him, but I hold it more against him when it's a very short book like this. Yeah, I mean, all I could think of when I finished this book was, oh my God, Matt's going to hate this book. And the reason I thought that is because you've talked to me over and over again about how like the first 100 to 150 pages of Sanderson books legitimately make you mad and frustrated. And then eventually he wins you over over the course of the novel, especially the longer novels. And I was like, oh, he doesn't have time to do that here. He doesn't have time to win Matt over. (laughs) What's going to happen? So I guess I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised that you you liked it as much as you did um and and i think you're right there are there's so many fun ideas here uh like a lot of really fun stuff like we'll we'll talk about the magic systems we'll talk about the concept of the soul and i really want to spend some time with you and and you chat uh diving into what was sanderson trying to say about the soul here um because i i think it's pretty complicated actually and i'm not sure i've really settled on exactly what i think it is so yeah people are not um trying to, to, to kill us in the chat. That's They're nice. just so angry they've been stunned to silence. Yeah. No, no I mean, it seems like there, there are some people who, who are saying, you know, they, they you know, you know not, not says it's really fun. I mean, that, that's that's the thing. Like, I agree. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's a fun story. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just like, I'm just like, ah, oh, like, like it could have been, <laughs> <laughs> like, like, like it, it's actually frustrating when you see something that like could be but isn't quite there. Um, um, Tringard says it's, it, it feels like Sanderson wishes they'd spent more time uh, making the soul and not so worried about the magic system. That's very much like what we said. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, Chris says that, that they wished it was a bit longer, which, you know, I, I that's kind of, I'm like, it either needed to be longer or it needed to be shorter. It feels, it feels like it's on this weird imbalance point. Yeah. Um, um okay. Do we want to stop ragging on it and like get in, get into it and talk about yeah, it a little sure. more Let's do that. Uh, and continue to rag on it through that? Yeah. Um, all right, so let's talk about the prologue. Oh, <laughs> we get to have the prologue conversation, Matt. <laughs> okay, let's do it. Um, all right, so I will. I will read the. Um, I'll read the first line. Galton ran his fingers along the thick canvas, inspecting one of the greatest works of art he had ever seen. Unfortunately, it was a lie. The woman is a danger. Hissed voices came from behind him. What she does is an abomination. 
Galton had tipped the canvas toward the hearth's orange-red light, squinting. In his old age, his eyes weren't what they had once been. Such precision, he thought, inspecting the brush strokes, feeling the layers of thick oils, exactly like those in the original. He would never have spotted the mistakes on his own. A blossom slightly out of position, a moon that was just a sliver too narrow, uh, too low in the sky. It had taken their experts days of detailed inspection to find the errors. She is one of the best forgers alive. The voices belong to Gauth and his fellow arbiters, the Empire's most important bureaucrats. She has a reputation as wide as the Empire. We need to execute her as an example. No. Frava, leader of the arbiters, had a sharp nasal voice. She is a valuable tool. This woman can save us. We must use her. Why? Gautena thought again. Why would someone capable of this artistry, this majesty, turn to forgery? Why not create, or create original paintings? Why not be a true artist? I must understand. Yes, Frava continued. The woman is a thief, and she practices a horrid art. But I can control her, and with her talents we can fix this mess we have found ourselves in. The others murmured worried objections. The woman they spoke of, Wan Sh Shailu, was more than a simple con artist, so much more. She could change the nature of reality itself. That raised another question. Why would she bother learning to paint? Wasn't ordinary art mundane compared to her mystical talents? So many questions. Gautana looked up from his seat beside the hearth. The others stood in a conspiratorial clump around Frava's desk, their long, colorful robes shimmering in the firelight. I agree with Frava, Gautana said. Okay, so this prologue is, what, like two pages long? So pretty short. Pretty short, pretty harmless little prologue. Uh, for those that are maybe listening to the book club for the first time and have never heard us talking about Sanderson, I have a, a, a beef with this guy. On his, I have a beef with prologues in general. I don't like them. I don't think they're very good, and I, I don't think they should exist most of the time. Um, and I think Sanderson is one of the people that's most guilty of this. Bishop is saying in chat that there was... <laughs> There was going to be a different prologue that had less relevance to the book, but the editor convinced him to cut it, which is hilarious. Um, I think this prologue is is harmless. And so one of the things I kind of realized when I was thinking about this prologue was it kind of isn't necessary. And this is kind of my beef with prologues in general, because everything that's discussed here, the, the basic setup, um, the, Gautona's like curiosity towards her as a forger his his inability to understand why someone who could create something this beautiful would not spend her talents creating their own thing rather than forging other things this is all stuff that is discussed ad nauseum in the book proper so it, it doesn't really need to be here in this setup framing device thing the thing that i realized the why it's here is because i think sanderson is trying to bookend his book with Gautona and in the opening scene he's talking about he's looking at the painting talking about how he doesn't understand why someone would ever forge thing and at the end of the book he's sitting in front of a fire um, looking at a great work of art again understanding completely why it is a great work of art despite being a forgery so the reason we did this prologue the reason we didn't just do everything that's every bit of information that's in here in the book proper which it already is is to kind of thematically and stylistically bookend ourselves and i think that's fine I, I i don't have i don't have anything really bad to say about this prologue at all yeah i, I guess i agree it's it's uh it, it's fine right like I, I agree with you in saying that it doesn't really have anything in here that isn't in the story proper and so if, if i still have my uh, uh this should be a, a short story hat on then i would say this is one thing that you could very easily cut. I, I, I don't I don't see any reason why we need to have Gautana's internal perspective when he shares all of his important thoughts with her anyway. He does. That's one really interesting thing about this book in general. And I think maybe this was just, again, my preconceived Sanderson notions getting in my way. I really thought that there was going to be a twist in this book. I, I In fact, I told you that. we yeah. When we recorded a podcast a couple of days ago, I was 20 pages to the end of the book. Um, and I just didn't get there before we had to record. And I was like, "There's it definitely feels like there's going to be a twist in this thing. And it's because Sanderson, Sanderson likes these throw everything you think you knew about the way the world works twists at you. Um, and so I was really expecting that in this book. I was really, I think the, the thing I guessed to you is like, I bet you that Gautana is going to actually be the emperor the whole time or something like that. That feels like the type of like throw everything 
and and shift everything dramatically type of twist. But this book really doesn't have that. It kind of just methodically continues almost exactly the way you think it would. She is able to complete the thing. Um, they were, of course, going to try to kill her anyway. She uh, knows that, and she escapes. And um, and then, like, she's successful. The Emperor is, like, I, basically nothing in this book happens that is like, oh, I can't believe that. And and look, I'm not saying that it needed that. At, not at all. But, like, a prologue like this kind of leads you to believe, oh, there's some there's some secret workings going on behind the scenes, actually, that our main character isn't going to know about. But actually, everything that's in here, you're right. The, uh, the characters that say to our protagonist pretty quickly into the, in the book it, it, itself. Yeah. John says the twist is that there isn't a twist. <laughs> <laughs> that I mean, yeah, fair, fair. The the closest thing to a twist is just realizing that the emperor isn't quite the person who, you know, the the characters thought he was. You know, and mm-hmm. and that's which is also the plot of the story, really. I mean, yeah, you could like like that's that's kind of what I that's kind of why I keep coming back to that is is like you could say like oh the plot of the story is is this character trying to escape from her imprisonment. And it's like, yeah, I mean, that's like, it's like the plot, but like the interest of the story, like the premise of the story is that's why it's why it's called the emperor's soul. It's because the objective here is she needs to figure out how to like, can the man's soul a level deeper than anyone has ever understood another human being without ever having talked to him mm-hmm. uh, just through talking to his acquaintances and learning about his life and reading his diaries. Fascinating idea, right? That's clearly the heart of the story. Yeah. And, um, and so the twist is, of course, as she learns about him, she's she finds surprises. So it's not a twist so much as it's just the unfolding of the narrative, and the and and that's fun, and I like that. Like that's the best part of the story. That's the core of the story. Mm-hmm. Um, I agree. I totally agree. Um, let's move on to the next slide where we kind of set up that okay. central thing, and maybe we could use this next slide to kind of talk about forgery a little bit here. The assassins did not survive the attack. Fravis said, "The glory faction does not yet know whether their ploy succeeded." You are going to replace the Emperor's soul with, she took a deep breath, with a forgery. They're crazy, Shai thought. Forging one own soul was difficult enough, and you didn't have to rebuild it from the ground up. The Arbiters had no idea what they were asking, but of course they didn't. They hated forgery, or so they claimed. They walked on imitation floor tiles past copies of ancient vases. They let their surgeons repair a body, but they didn't call any of these things forgery in their own tongue. The forgery of the soul, that was what they considered an abomination which meant Shai really was their only choice. No one in the government would be capable of this. She probably wasn't either. Can you do it? Gautona asked. I have no idea, Shai thought. Yes, she said. <laughs> it will need to be an exact forgery, Frava said sternly. If the glory faction has any inkling of what we done, they will pounce. The emperor must not act erratically. I said I could do it, Shai replied, but it will be difficult. I will need information about Ashravan's and his life. Everything we can get. Official histories will be a start, but they'll be too sterile. I need extensive interviews and writings about him from those who do him best. Servants, friends, family members. Did he have a journal? Yes, Gautona said. Excellent. Those documents are sealed, said one of the other arbiters. He wanted them destroyed. Everyone in the room looked toward the man. He swallowed, then looked down. You shall have everything you request, Frava said. Um, all right. So... I, I, I like this setup a whole lot, um, and I, I love – so I, I guess I guess here, first of all, let's talk about forgery general. I think it's a really cool idea, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool concept. This, 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 I mean, Sanderson always comes up with really interesting magic concepts, right, where he, like, takes one nugget of an idea and says, okay, but what if, and then he expands upon it from there. I think this is remarkably one of the ones that's maybe the least explored from, a like, a, a real – down and dirty detail method one like i feel like in his other magic system there's like charts and like mappings and power levels and these things yeah. and, it's, and this it's really just it's really much more focused on just like the the art the artistic nature of it yeah. and and i think the understanding like that's that's kind of the cool thing is is all you really need to do is you need to understand the history of the thing and and understand its nature in a very deep and complete way mm-hmm. and it's not like she you know has to you know she's not burning metals she's not there, there's no there's no like exchange of energy she just like kind of does it and it, and it works um and that's you know that's exactly what's called for in this story right it's it's because it's like it's it's just a it's a smaller it's a smaller story about yeah um 
about a about understanding a human being right yeah. and and um yeah I, I think there's a lot there's a lot there yeah i mean and I, one of the things that I, I pulled this slide in particular for is is the part um where it, it really talks about the hypocrisy of this society and the arbiters like they hate like and, and gautona as well like this idea that we hate things that are forged we hate things that are faked but we also use it all the time. Like they have forgers, everything in their their palace is forgery and, and some kind. They just are, are. It's very interesting showing like where um, where the lines are drawn and not drawn um, in in you know what they say they're okay with and what they don't say they're okay with. I mean, the next slide we're going to talk about is is the the freaking blood sealing people which is another thing they consider heresy but they're going to bring them in the castle and use them you know and so there's this idea of you know what what we decide we're comfortable with and we not decide we're comfortable with is very malleable um to to our needs we like the pretty vase it's much easier to forge a pretty vase than to actually have a pretty vase made and so we're going to be okay with that here yeah i mean they basically seem to be pragmatic in in terms of what they'll actually use and then they just have their dogma um when it comes to uh, you have to assume like with all cultures the dogma is just the thing that allows them to justify their power um mm -hmm. yeah certainly um and then there's i guess the concept of that is introduced here of exactly what you said you know how who 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 is a person what is a soul how are you defined and and how do you express that? I love the idea of, you know, being able to construct a person from th their own writings. I mean, there, I think there's something there, this, this book is dealing with art a lot, you know, it, with the concept of creation and art mm -hmm. and a journal is, is its own form of artistic expression. You know, you're writing your life out. We learn here that he's writing it out specifically for himself and he obsessively reads and rereads it over and over and over and over again. And it's so fascinating. Um, the ways in which, you know, she is able to clue in with that combined with other things to who he is as a person. Because, like, I, I got I to gotta be honest with you, there was a part of me reading this book that the whole time was like, I know she's going to succeed at the end, but also, like, I'm not sure if I buy the idea that you can fully recreate the intense, intri intricate complexities of a human being just by reading their journals and, and asking about them and studying them. I, I'm not sure I, I fully buy that idea. Um, and I, I still don't know if I do, but I think the book made a, a compelling argument at least. Yeah. So, so I, um, I think the book leaves enough slack in like the way the magic actually works for you to, for you to, to accept it. But like I had the same exact problem where, where I was thinking like, I mean, I have enough, I have enough trouble with the concept of like an upload um, in, in the <laughs> sense of like uploading your mind. Cause I'm yeah. like, I'm like, I, in, in some sense, I, I believe that like if, if you monitor like every synapse in a human brain over a period of time and you scan every, you know, memory molecule and, and you upload all of that, then you can have a person who will, who will act basically indistinguishably from that person. But like, what does it feel like to be that person? Is it, really the same person like these are really fascinating questions right and this is talking about a much lower level of resolution this is just literally his diaries and, and some recollections but then we have then we have this added magical idea that, that there's like a snap to grid function where like if you're close enough then it like takes all the way right like like we see this happen when she applies the uh the seals to gautana and it's like if it's wrong then it just like bounces off and if it's right then it like works and, and then and then you see it sort of like ramify and, and and work like thoroughly um so i think i think the magic system allows us to kind of wave away that particular concern but not completely though because like there is also the fact that i think he's explicitly like mi missing some memories that the real um the real dude should have had the real ashravan should have had um so i guess i mean ultimately correct me if i if i've misremembered but i think the book is sort of saying like it kind of it kind of isn't the same guy. No, yeah. But it is it is a different guy who's gonna behave similarly and maybe even better than the original Ashravan. 
Yeah. Yeah. Which is, I, I, you know, we're jumping like slides and slides ahead. And frankly, y'all, I, because this is such a short book, I'm almost okay with us just abandoning the whole slide thing and just talking about things as we go. I mean, we can, we can kind of maybe get back on track, but I, I love just kind of having a free form conversation about a book this, this short. But, um, I, I think one of the things that is so fascinating to me is trying to really inspect what does that mean though you know so like we've we've constructed a a magical system in which if you're close enough to a soul you can almost get there all the way um and and while at the same time acknowledging that it's not exactly the same as kyrgyzstan says close enough for government work right um and so what are we saying about the nature of the soul in that because I mean, because it is really interesting that we call it the soul in this. It's not. It's not. We didn't reconstruct the emperor's brain. We didn't reconstruct the emperor's personality. We didn't reconstruct the emperor. We reconstructed the emperor's soul. And it really speaks to me as uh, knowing that Brandon Sanderson is, you know, someone who is, uh, who is spiritual, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the idea of the soul as this thing and this this inc- you know incredibly unique and powerful thing that is that is the core of who you are can be in a way manufactured close enough to be recreated um which is a really interesting concept and i yeah. <laughs> i think you and i were joking about how uh, brandon sanderson's writing career has has mostly been him just like slowly sl- sliding away from his spirituality over time because he just keeps studying it and studying it and poking it from different angles via his stories and um i, I find that i don't i don't think that's actually true but i, yeah. I find that really fascinating yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I, I think I think he is a person who is who is very interested in, in the idea of a soul. I think mm-hmm. I think this is an idea that actually in some regard comes up in a lot of his stories because he has like, you know, soul soul bound weapons and, and spirits that are that are incorporeal and yeah. and, and a lot of stuff of that nature. Um, you know, to it, it's interesting, though, because you can make it much more. You know, I, I mentioned brain uploads. You mentioned spirituality. You can actually make it way more. Uh, uh, brass tacks and say like brain damage like like a person gets gets serious brain damage yeah they can come back from it often um but they they will they'll usually come back a little different Mm -hmm. and that's a fascinating philosophical question that i don't think we have any real answers for and and that's really kind of similar to what this is right it's almost like he got severe brain damage and she's doing a kind of uh, magical surgery on him that's mm-hmm. meant to like repair repair slash replace his his brain with parts that are that are a simulacrum uh, I don't know if there's anything left of the original him there or not I don't know if the book is is explicit about that yeah um, but, I, um I, I like that for I like that frame of reference a lot because you know part of what I struggled with was this general idea of like obviously like at the end of the book we're kind of supposed to feel hopeful for the kingdom or the empire um we're kind of supposed to feel hopeful for this version of ashravan who basically in a in a way gets a second chance to do things better um i think we're supposed to feel hopeful about those things but there was there was a part of me if i'm being honest with myself that felt a little icky about the idea that like oh we've just like created a person and manipulated him like okay the slide says, like, I, I'm just going to skip to it. I'm just going to skip the slide because I think I want to talk about this, and I think we're abandoning yeah. the concept of slides this time. It's a short but, book. It's fine. Um, yeah. Um, so the, the very last p- pages, she's, she says – I don't – actually, I don't think I, I pulled that particular part, but she says something to the effect of in the very – in the note that she leaves to Gautana, um, she says something to the effect of, he's still the same person. Like, I didn't – I didn't, like – incept him in a way that that completely changes what he would do or who he is i just kind of pushed and nudged him in certain ways you know and i'm mm-hmm. like but you're still like uh, that still feels icky to me a little bit that uh-huh. you're like pushing and nudging me like i didn't consent to that i don't know there's right. a, there's a part of it where i get that the book wants me to feel hopeful and optimistic about these things and i did feel hopeful and optimistic but there's also a part of me that's like i don't know how i feel about i don't know how i feel about the concept of of recreating my essence you know yeah, no, that that was really um, a, a surprising turn that it took, where the book says that she she actually kind of made him a little bit better. Like yeah. that, that was kind yeah. of the intro joke, and, and I'm like, okay, okay, hold on. Like, well, I think what you just said there is the key that it's like done without his consent. The closest thing you can say is 
he wanted to be a better man. She knows this is true from reading his 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 diaries. Like mm-hmm. he he was an intensely introspective person who was trying to better himself, and and he knew that he had kind of strayed from his own his own uh, uh, ambitions for for how to be a good man. And she's just like helping him out by kind of making him the way he should be. But still, it's like, aren't you kind of robbing him of of the of the opportunity to make himself better? <laughs> I, I don't know. It's it's. But yeah, they, I, like I'm I'm pretty transhumanist, all things considered. But that still strikes me as a little. It's like erasing the person he was and replacing him with a better version. Yeah, this. yeah, and I mean, as I think John is saying in chat, I think the fascinating thing about this character is that like, a lot of her motivation for doing this is, yes, I think there is some of I want to you know. I've kind of I've kind of really become fascinated with this person, and I do see it as a tragedy that he stopped being the person he was, uh, this this young idealistic person who wanted to change the world, and he stopped that. But also, part of it is just she wants to see if she can do it, and she she really want, loves the challenge, and she's kind of obsessed to, 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 with to an unhealthy level that almost gets her killed to know that she was able to do it, that she was able to put the finest con that she's ever done and put it on display in front of thousands of people like the book ends with this woman like saying all right i'm gonna go hide in the forest for a while and then i'm gonna go fucking kill the guy that turned me in so i i I think to john's point we're not supposed to feel like like ambiguously positive towards this woman right she's complicated she's she steals from people she like that's that's how she lives her life she also creates incredible art um the both these things are true at the same time yeah, I mean, I, I think the the fact that she's a con woman and a thief and so forth is is sort of textually justified by the fact that she exists in a in sort of this empire where she's like this extremely marginalized ethnic group, um, mm-hmm. and, and like like it's it's a sort of like Roman provinces situation almost. I don't sure. know. We're kind of we're kind of allowed to fill in the blanks actually. Well, yeah. Um, but um, yeah. at the very least, I feel I don't feel too bad about the about the things that she's doing because I feel like this is one of the few paths available to her in her world. Yeah. So that's interesting. John says so much of her personality is hidden behind lies and self-deception that it's hard to know. Um, That's interesting. I guess, John, do you feel then at the moment at the end where she talks to Gautana and is like, look, I manipulated you in the easiest way possible. I just was completely honest with you the whole time. And I won you over to my side through complete honesty. Is she lying about that? Is she, was she completely honest with him? What do you think, Matt? Yeah, cuz cuz I felt like that was like the classic Sanderson moment where he is he is a, a, a big softy and and he loves to have his characters have like a moment of of like yeah, you 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 thought I was a a rough-edged uh, a scoundrel, but actually it turns out that I'm going to sacrifice my life to save all of the kids or whatever, you know, whatever <laughs> whatever this, the the appropriate story moment is. Like that's that was her the whole book you 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 know she's she's putting up this facade of being like conniving and and manipulative but actually just like every human being what she really craves is authenticity and and connection between human beings and she makes a real connection with Gautana even though she's sort of trying to con him but ultimately ultimately she kind of she kind of can't con him the only way she can really get him on on her side is to um communicate with him and uh and and you know share with him and um because she tells him everything right like like anyway what is uh did, did john did john reply i don't think well, he's replied not, just yet but yet. but jay introduces something interesting wasn't the framing more i made it so he might become a better person yes i i think i think it's certain it's certainly true that like the emperor could just wake up one day and decide not to do any of these things but like look at this part i have right up here um Ashravan's near death would send him in a period of deep introspective. He would seek his journal, reading again and again the counts of his youthful self. He would see what he had had been and would finally truly seek to recover it. That was where she pushed him. She pushed him towards that. Like, like I, I'm not. Sh- I, I don't think the book says that. Like, had she not done this, like, had he just survived the assassination attempt on his own, would that have been his reaction to it? It, it kind of textually says, like, I made it so he would react to his assassination in a very specific way that attempts to get him back to his core um, idealistic version of himself. Yeah, I think it's, uh, you, you know, I, I can I can see what, what Jay is saying, that there is some level of ambiguity to it, but I mm-hmm. think it... I, I lean I lean I think it leans in the direction of of like she had an intent here 
that this was her this is her aim is, is she wasn't just making a, a good enough photocopy she actually wants to kind of make put her own personal mark on it right she th there is a bit of ego in this for her more than a little bit i would say actually because yeah, she's yeah. got kind of a huge chip on her shoulder about the whole <laughs> uh, forging does. thing yeah yeah so let's talk about that a little bit um let's talk about one of the other you know we've been talking about the the concept of the soul and and what is a person and how do you define you know who you are and what you are but let's talk about what the book is kind of saying maybe largely about creation because uh Gaut Gautina is throughout the whole thing like kind of flabbergasted with this woman who clearly um clearly is like an incredibly talented artist right like she's beyond just the forging she's like incredibly talented mm -hmm. um and he doesn't understand you know i think that his re his refrain throughout the entire book is i don't understand why you wouldn't put that talent towards something uh real versus versus these these mere forgeries you're going you're going to create and i think the book kind of the, the, the attitude of the book, I think, and the way we kind of leave Gautina at the end of it is that, oh, no, the, these these forgeries, despite being forgeries, are works of art. And to me, that spoke to the concept of there's nothing in the in the world of art and the world of storytelling. There's nothing original under the sun anymore. Like every story is in some ways borrowing and taking from the stories that came before it. So, you know, like it, it is this iterative process of, you know, taking stories and saying, oh, that's a great idea, but I can improve it here and I can tinker with it here. And here's what this means to me. And here's how I view it. And and, and that's that's what creation is. So I think in to, in my mind, that is what that is what the book is talking about. What about you? Yeah, I mean, it's funny. I, I, I was thinking something along the lines, tongue in cheek, that the book is about fan fiction. <laughs> um, because you know, and I, I think you're more on the mark that, that it's about, it's about, um, you know, if we're going to try to twist it and make it autobiographical about, about Sanderson, it's, it's like, you know, Hey, why, why are you writing these, these fantasy novels for, for, for young people? Why don't you write some real literature? And, and it's like, <laughs> I, number one, shove it. Number two, like it's, it, it's, it's good like, like people like it, it is it, it is using tropes yes it is using a framework of of storytelling that it, that is sort of um already exists but but obviously there's a lot of artistry that is uh, invested into it and yeah. obviously people love it right Let's... like i think that's that, that's the main thing is is there is a lot of art artistry invested in a forgery yeah and and, and she knows that and the outfit it doesn't and, and she's just like look like i don't I don't even need to explain this to you. you I, like you don't, you don't need to agree with me. I just, the, the, this is how I live my life. It's mm -hmm. her attitude. Yeah. Well, let's, I mean, if we want to, you saying the word fan fiction kind of unlocks something for me, because if we want to talk about creating art that is based off of other people's art, what about the guy who finished the wheel of time series? <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. I mean, That's, it's, it's the forgery, it's the forgery <laughs> of the, the last two books. Yeah. It's an authorized forgery, but certainly it's like Sanderson was sitting in his jail cell counting the different kinds of stones. And someone came to him and said, the emperor has died. We need you to recreate him the best way possible. Please read over all his old notes and, and recreate a version of himself um, in these last few books that he didn't get to finish. Right. I mean, that, that's not yeah. entirely wrong, right? I, I don't. I don't think I'm reaching too much. I mean, God, like, like now that I think of it, because like I've always had these complaints about the wheel of the, the final wheel of time books, and and it's like they really sound a lot like what I was just saying about my feelings about her, her completing the emperor's soul in a way that was, you know, not quite right, and and it's like this book is almost her saying like, like you know, her slash Sanderson saying like, look, I know it's not quite right. There's mm -hmm. no way the emperor's soul slash the final books of the wheel of time could have ever been exactly the way they were supposed to be because a tragic event occurred. Yeah. Um, but like I, I tried my best to understand what the basic idea was. And mm -hmm. then I, and then I did my best to implement it using all of my skill as an artist. And, and look, I have not read the wheel of time, but couldn't you say that maybe a, a young idealistic, uh, <laughs> Robert Jordan lost his way a little bit over the course of, <laughs> of writing those novels. Uh -huh. In the um, course of like the last three or four of them. Yeah. yeah. And so Sanderson not only wanted to pick up and finish and recreate 
Robert Jordan, but but wanted to you know just do just do a, a core to himself, but but better version. Yeah, because if we're being honest, if if Sanderson had had literally just like been possessed by the soul of of Robert Jordan, he would have written eight more books, and they would have gotten increasingly rambling. So so yes, I mean, <laughs> it's it's you're exactly right. Um, uh, I what, like what's I don't, the timeline here. <laughs> I, I yeah I mean good question I don't I, look I I think this is one of those fun things in art where it, it's it's ninety five percent likely that Brandon Sanderson never thought about that once while creating this thing but that doesn't mean it wasn't there in him on some subconscious soul level that perhaps uh, Shay would have would have picked up on if she was perusing his journals of himself you know I, I don't know I, I it's it's just it's fun to think about um it's it's delightful like I didn't think about that at all while reading this book and you kind of unlocked it for me as we were talking and the more we talked about it, I was like oh this this actually fits really well actually that's great um yeah it makes me it makes me really like the book actually um that's what that's the missing yeah. that's the missing piece that I had to unlock the whole thing for me well, so, you know, the, the thing is happening where you and I right now are talking about the stuff that we think is really strong in mm -hmm. the book. Mm -hmm. And it and it is like I, I did. Lo I loved all this stuff. It's just this stuff is like padded within a bunch of other stuff that I, I just was like, OK, I guess we're I guess we have to do the, the like fantasy fantasy uh, prison break thing for some reason. I just didn't care for that. Like, the yeah. Whole, yeah. We've mentioned that offhand a few times, but I just want to say I agree with you. I feel like this is this is you know, first of all, what I want to say is the action in Sanderson books usually ends up working on me rather well. Um, you know, where it's a book that I'm feeling so so on, and then he just meticulously constructs these action sequences that like endear you to the character, and you just like have these fuck yeah, I love this thing now moments. Um, but I think this is the one book that just didn't need any of that in it. Um, I, I don't think we needed the, her transforming into the ninja character yeah. and, and fighting the skeletons at the end. I, mean, I just don't think we needed it. The, also, the thing about the fuck yeah action moments is they're almost always actually rooted in like some amazing character moment, often involving like saving others or something. Mm -hmm. And this was literally just her like, like, you know, um, uh, morbid time and um, <laughs> and yeah. beating up some skeletons and then it, it was, was cool. Like, don't get me wrong, it was cool. It was cool, and it's a cool idea. Like, it's a cool idea that she can change her own nature too. Like, yeah, I can see that being a thing where that occurred to Sanderson. And he was like, "Oh, I just have to use that." And I'm like, I'm like, like this is the problem. Is like, it, it's it's kind of cool, but I don't know if it's cool enough to justify its footprint in the text. Yeah. Um, and well, that's the, the tendency to sprawl. I mean, it definitely ties into this this idea of, you know, who are you, right? And I think one of the things it makes you wonder about her is, like, if she's been doing this to herself so many times, you know, if she's created these these soul forges of, of different versions of herself, um, you know, who is she at her core, right? What when does, when does that person get so manipulated and changed both through the magic system and also just through the, the natural mundane wearing of masks and being of characters where uh who are who who are who you are stops being something that even you fully understand um right yeah you sort of i i think i wondered at a certain point whether shy was even originally shy you know like sure like like, like she uses the stamp on herself to become a ninja warrior like like is is this version of her like the 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 the, the ultimate master forger character that she is that she has made herself into mm -hmm. i mean I, I think some of the stuff john has been saying i think um may, maybe she hasn't literally used like her her magic to make herself into who she is but maybe she has made herself into who she is simply through like sheer force of will mm -hmm. um like mm -hmm. she, she is sort of her own artistic product just by virtue of like deciding to be you know uh and i i think that's um I guess I'll just say I don't see any direct textual evidence that she has incepted herself and that, and that that's the character that we have met, but it's possible. Um, it's she's so ambiguous as a character that I mm -hmm. think I think you could have that read and I would support you on it for sure. So, yeah. Yeah. I wonder if anybody else feels us there. Mm -hmm. By the way, John says that uh, the Emperor's Soul was written at the same time as A Memory of Light. OK, so uh, he was thinking about it. He was yeah. thinking about it. Yeah. <laughs> 
yeah, I mean, Robert Jordan is the emperor. That's, that's, that's exactly what he's doing. Mm-hmm. Kirkistan, points, Kirkistan points out that, like, she talks about her aunt and uncle multiple times throughout the story. Um, and we learn at the end that uh, she didn't have an aunt and uncle, that that's fake memories that she gave herself. So, so he's doing it on minor levels, at least. Yeah, so I, I guess... I guess I wasn't clear whether she had incepted herself like literally or whether that was just like her, her sort of story that she told herself. I, yeah. I don't remember. Actually. I mean, I, I think the lovely thing about this magic system is it, it, that, that can remain kind of unknown, right? That like, like our, our <laughs> is the person we are influenced by people around us, you know, rubber stamping us with, this is who I think you are, or is it influenced by our own ability to define craft and, um, display the person we want to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's a good that's a good thing to bring up because there's also I think uh, an element of, of the idea that yes, people are doing that to each other all the time. Like um, the emperor sort of resented Galtina even because he felt like Galtina had sort of, in his own non magical way, stamped him with a certain mentality and, and attitude, and, and sort of made him feel obligated to become the emperor, which which he um he actually resented that kind of pressure but at the same time he went along with it yeah and and it was this complicated push and pull where it was like he loved Gautana and that's why he did it but then he came to resent him because of that and and that's um um that's totally the same basic idea here is you're let you're letting other people sort of push you into being someone other than who you would have been otherwise mm-hmm. yeah and and like maybe the emperor's quote unquote fall I guess was just the the um the result of thousands of people surrounding you constantly stamping you with who they think you are. And, and how, how, how much does that happen have to happen before you just start to kind of become that person, right? Like Mm -hmm. if you have, if you have this team of advisors surrounding you constantly telling you how you think, how you should be behaving, the type of emperor you should be, the type of person you should be, how long before that just becomes who you are. Um, Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, that's very true. Like if that, if that fits, if it, like, that's why I love the, the concept of forging this idea of like, like a desk knows what it is, knows where it came from. And it also wants to be the best version of itself. And I think that's human beings too, right? Like we know who we are kind of, um, we know our history and we want to be the best version of ourselves. So if you give, that's kind of what the snapping to grid thing you talked about is it's like, Oh, you give me an opportunity to be the best version of myself and my soul quote unquote, will just go, Oh, yep, that's me. Um, and so you can be manipulated and convinced in that regard as well. And I think that's what, that's what happens to people, you know, like, I think that happens in relationships all the time. If you're in a relationship with someone that that tells you this is who you are, this is your value, this is what you're worth, um, th- this is how you react to things. Eventually, if you're if you if you're there and you experience it enough, you can kind of just start to adapt to that way of thinking. Um, and that's sure. yeah, that's yeah. terrible. Um, but it's true, right? Yeah. Uh, there's there's less terrible ways of of, think, of looking at it too though i think you know being either you know being a parent or you know being in a really demanding like uh, institution like the military um these can be things where you you maybe do become someone better than who you started out as mm-hmm. in certain ways at least um by sort of putting putting a, a demand on yourself or the rather you're putting yourself in an environment where the environment is putting a demand on you um and uh I don't know. I guess I guess it's certainly certainly complicated and ambiguous. And there's, um, and I think we're always kind of changing, right? So yeah, um, I, that's why I love the the idea of oh well he'll he'll have to restamp himself every day. And I feel like that's ju- just a magical metaphor for the concept of waking up each morning and being like, okay, do, do it's a new day, it's a fresh start. What do I want to be today? What do I want to work towards today? What type of person do I see myself at the end of this day? And what do I have to accomplish to do that? And that's kind of like you're stamping yourself, you know? Um, I, yeah. I think that, I think that, I think that the, the reason I like the magic system so much is you can remove the magic from it and it just becomes human behavior in a lot yeah. of ways. Um, yeah, I, I like that. Really cool. it, it, it becomes Marcus Aurelius waking up and reminding himself that the people he's going to encounter are going to be uh, uh, truculent and uh, uh, frustrating. And, <laughs> Um, yes yes okay so i've been sitting on this slide for uh, a couple minutes and it actually 
brought me to something that I think is worth talking about, the, which is one of the things the book is saying is the destruction of art, right? Because um, we have this painting here um, that we're told she snuck in, stole the painting, replaced it with a fake, and then also had a different fake that she put in her home that is meant to distract you from the real fake, um, and that the actual original is destroyed. And later we learn it was destroyed specifically at the request of the artist himself, right? He said, I want you to destroy this painting because um, I painted it for someone that I loved and they're gone now, and so destroy it. Um, and so what What do you think about the destruction of art? Because the, the, the way the story leaves us at the end is, is Gautzna takes this this beautiful work of art that is the book that kind of explains who the emperor is, what the emperor's soul is, and throws it in the fire and says, it's better if this isn't seen. Um, and mm -hmm. the, the line I really like here is, um, it doesn't matter. No one will know what I've done. They will keep looking at the fake and be satisfied. So there's no harm done. Um, and so that's a really interesting idea, right? Of, of, if, like, for example, if you took the Mona Lisa out of the Louvre, which you should because it's kind of a shitty painting, but um, if if you did that and replaced it with a print of the Mona Lisa, but nobody knew about it, right? What difference does it make? At the end of the day, well, it, it makes a difference on, like, a, I guess, a, a, a moral level or, like, a, 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 a cosmic level of it's not the real thing, and therefore it is less valuable somehow. But, like, if every if every single person believes it's the real thing, isn't it just the real thing? Yeah. I, I think they had the same, you know, they had the same experience as whether, whether or not it's the real thing, as long as they believe that it's the real thing. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so in, in that, you know, you, you said there's a moral difference. I'm like, yeah, well, it depends on what moral like equation we're going by. <laughs> sure. Because, sure. Cause, Cause I can definitely see a case where, yeah, it does. It, it, it is, you know, you, you did an immoral thing because you, you stole from people what they thought they were getting. But on the other hand, in a more consequentialist view, if they never find out, and if you can somehow guarantee that they won't, then um, you haven't harmed them because they have not experienced anything different. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it, it does raise a lot of interesting questions about um, like the sort of the rights of the artist relative to the art, because it, it actually flies in the face of a lot of memes that you see nowadays where, where the idea is like, is like, you know, Star Wars is or is ours now because because you know George Lucas doesn't have the right to change the the to, to make these special editions because he you know it's he gave it to us and it's ours and he's changing it and it's mm -hmm. ruining our childhood, um, and and ver you know variations on this not just about Star Wars obviously but just like this 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 increasingly fraught you know fan creator relationship thing that we see happening in the world yeah, yeah. and and this book is you know or, or at least at least shy in, in this book is taking a pretty strong stance along the lines of, of like this the art always belongs to me <laughs> the, the, the art always belongs to the person who created it uh, yeah. and they and they always maintain the right to destroy it or alter it um and and furthermore if you can't even tell the difference between the real version and the forgery, then what? Then, then who the hell are you to, to criticize me anyway? Um, like, like Gauth and I, like you couldn't tell the difference. So yeah. why do you care that I burned the original, right? Yeah, because um, on some level, knowing that it's not real devalues it to him, and that drives him crazy. So mm -hmm. it's almost it's almost that the danger here has nothing to do with the the forgery itself, but knowledge of the forgery, right? Mm -hmm. That like, and the same with the emperor, as John is saying, if everyone believes this man standing in front of them saying he's the emperor is the emperor, isn't he just the emperor then? Isn't that just who that's it's him now? Everyone believes he's him. He's him. And then and then in the back of your mind, or at least the back of my mind, I go, but it's not though. And then the, the counter to that is, but does that matter? And I go, well, shouldn't it though? Well, maybe, but does it? <laughs> and, and it's like, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, yeah, I think um, I, I basically share your confusion. I, I, I'm i just attempting to, to, to find some, some anchor here because, because I'm like, well, it, it, it's only, it's only the same if it's the same, right? Like if it's, if it's a if it's a close enough facsimile to the Mona Lisa that nobody could mistake it or that, that nobody could notice, um, then that's one thing. But if it's like, you know, if if one in every hundred people are looking at the Mona Lisa and being like, that smile doesn't look quite right, then like it's not 
it's not really. Yeah. Um, and and so the question is like, well, if it, it gets down to this idea of of like, well, if the copy's if the copy's good enough, I don't know. I, I don't know, man. There's there's a lot of met- metaphysical questions to the idea of of you know, is, is this thing actually this other thing? If it's like, let's just pretend that she could have literally made an identical copy. Mm-hmm. The book isn't saying that she did, but let's pretend that she could have made an identical copy. Would that still be the emperor? You know, down to the atom. Yeah. If you use the Star Trek transporter and you made an identical copy of of the Mona Lisa down to the atom, I it, like part of me wants to say yes, part of me wants to say no. I think we have different. I think there are different intuitions for what it means for two things to be the same. Yeah, because um, I mean, isn't part of the value of the Mona Lisa? that it is that particular Mona Lisa, right? That like, mm-hmm. here's this painting painted by this very famous painter hundreds of years ago. Um, like, isn't that at least a little part of it? Like, yeah. like, isn't the, the, the majesty of the Sistine Chapel that some dude went up there and sat on boards painting the ceiling for months at a time? Right. Like, and, and so if we make a perfect copy of that thing this is you know you were talking about this actually you and i i think on a do after dark not not long ago when you were talking about um (laughs) classic cars the recreation of classic cars and it's like isn't at least part of the value of a classic car that it is actually the classic car and Mm. i mean and how do you how do you put how how do you accurately put value on that and by the way i i'm not proposing i know the answers to any of these questions because i I do not but i just think it's it is a very interesting avenue to go down um of of that that idea like certainly certainly part of the value of this particular painting is that it was painted by this particular man at that particular time so i i Man, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, a big part of my enjoyment of like Michelangelo's David is, you know, looking at this enormous thing and being like, wow, like this dude just sat there chiseling on this for months and months and months and months. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And if it's like, no, no, this is actually a copy made by a machine, then you're like, oh, (laughs) (laughs) cool i guess yeah and and uh, I, I think jay brings up a really really excellent point here if it's painted by someone who understood the true soul of the art as well as the original painter isn't it just as valuable i would argue yes but still differently right like like if we're measuring like value points yes it would have equal value points but they would be different value points like that would be wow that you did an incredible job understanding it. You did, you did a beautiful, wonderful job of getting to the core of this thing so well that you've created a perfect facsimile. That is incredible. You have immense value. I am in awed by your work and your work by itself is a piece of art, but that doesn't mean that the original piece of art isn't valuable separately as well. Uh, yeah. I, I want to do a social experiment where we get somebody to read the Wheel of Time novels without telling them or, or letting them know in any way that the final books aren't written by the same person and just see if they notice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, John points out that like the thing that she hates the most is these mass manufactured vases um, versus the ones that are lovingly crafted, even if it's lovingly crafted through the, the act of forgery. So it is it is the act of creation that 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 adds value um, to, to a thing. Um, and I think that's what Gautona can't see, right? That like you still created a, a, a thing, even if it is a forgery of another thing, it required art and artistic merit and mm. value to create that thing. And, and I think, um, it, it, in my own sort of mental model, my translation of the phrase like art would be more like humanity. Like she's invested her own humanity. She's imprinted yeah. her own soul, her own humanity upon even something as simple as like the stained glass window. Um, and if it had been part of some automated process without any thought put into it, it wouldn't be art because it wouldn't be invested with soul, with humanity. Yeah. So the emperor's soul has a little bit of uh, her soul in it. So it's certainly true. Hey, here's another idea that connects to other things that we talk about all the time. Okay. Um, so Stephen King says that when he writes novels, when he writes stories, he thinks of it as discovering something, dis- discovering an artifact that exists already. Like he's, he's discovering the story. He's not, he's not inventing it. He's finding, he's, he's, he's finding a story that already exists 
um, and and uh, doesn't this map so well into the idea that like every every window every every desk has a soul mm -hmm. um, and, and and you just have to get to, you just have to get to understand that soul on a deep level in order to um, change the outward appearance of it even though you know it still it still knows that it's the same, it's the same desk um, yeah uh, you could you could sub out the word soul for story and I think you mm -hmm. end up in much the same place so I think you're you're spot on there and, and to, to connect that to, to the wheel of time novels it, it's like it's like those those stories did end the way Robert Jordan wanted them to but they were written by a different person so so was the soul of those novels preserved was was the you know, in Stephen King, like, is, is the discovered story the same, even though it was written differently? Mm -hmm. I don't know. We're asking, we're asking a lot of questions that don't have answers. <laughs> but that's uh, the fun part, right? That that's the fun part. That's the fun part. Yeah. All right. Um, we've kind of just been going all over the place. Is there anything else, Matt, that you specifically wanted to talk about? Um, I guess have, we haven't talked about the blood sealers very much. Yeah. How, can we, can we relate that? to any of the themes that we've been talking about so far, because I am struggling to, but that doesn't mean we can't. I'm just, I'm just giving us the opportunity to try to relate that. Yeah. Does anybody want to do our, our work for us and find a way that the blood, <laughs> the blood sealers are, are, are related. I mean, um, you know, I think I, I get my, I didn't think a whole lot about the blood sealers, but I think basically the blood sealers are just another way of engaging with this idea that like everything has its own, um, its own nature, you know, its own, um, um, inalienable nature, which, which has to do with like, well, your, you know, your blood is, is a physical part of you. And so that's part of your nature. And so we can use your blood to sort of track you or control you. Um, and it's like, it's, I guess it's kind of like a, a dark twisted way of, of thinking about it. But, yeah. um, I, I didn't have much beyond that. No, I mean, I think, I think cynically, without thinking about it very much, I'm with Tringard that it was just a, a plot mechanism to come up with another reason why she couldn't just easily escape. Um, it, and, and it functions very well in that, but I, I, I want to give the book the benefit of the doubt and say perhaps it went a little deeper than that. And I think you're, I think you're onto something there. It's not exactly clear to me. Um, it was honestly the thing that felt the most out of place in the story that like, I wonder if there was just a, another mechanism for preventing her to escape that, wasn't that? I don't know. I don't know. I'm I'm trying to be as charitable as I can, but I did not care for the blood sealers very much. Maybe maybe that's the Elant Elantris connection that we're not getting. I don't know. Maybe that's what that comes. I, I don't I don't know at all. Yeah. You know what Kyrgyzstan is saying and, and what John was saying earlier. Like, I agree that the book has a lot of ideas under the surface, and like mm -hmm. that's what we've been talking about this whole time. It, it's my complaint is actually that I wish that it focused on that and that there was less of the sort of, um, I, I don't, I'm, I'm trying to find like a, a, a non pejorative word, just like all of the cruft around the edges Yeah. where it, where it was just like, we don't like, we don't have to do that. Like I would, it's, it doesn't make the book better. It doesn't like the, I really don't think it does to, well, to have to have like an action scene, for example. So, I mean, here's here's the thing I've noticed with myself and Sanderson over the past few conversations we have. Um, and, and by the way, I, I'm not going to blame Sanderson for this. I'm going to fully blame myself, but I, I think it's an interesting thing that happens. I watch a movie like everything everywhere all at once. Like we talked about this week on the Doofcast, mm -hmm. and I leave that movie thinking about so many different things and ideas. The movie speaks to me on, on so many different levels and I'm thinking about all these things and I'm like turning over in my head what the things mean when I read a Sanderson book, I'm not saying it's not there, but I never leave the book thinking about this stuff. I never do it. And then we have a book club about it, and I'm forced to, through the conversations we're having with our audience, really start thinking about this stuff. And then, then through these conversations, the book opens up to me. But that would never happen with me if I didn't have these conversations. And I find it really interesting, the art that allows me, through just itself to dive into it and really analyze it and pick it apart and see the things it's doing and see the depth of those things and the art that requires me to have conversations about it. And again, I'm not using that as like a, a judgment call on the quality of the artist. I'm just really curious as to 
why that consistently happens. I, I don't have an answer here, but it, it, I, I've definitely been noticing a trend with myself mm -hmm. on this. Yeah, and I know exactly what you're talking about. We, we sometimes joke on our Stephen King podcast that like he, he, he doesn't really do subtlety, which is not fair or true even because mm -hmm. he, he does. But what we're really trying to say is that he, if he wants you to understand what he's doing, he will just tell you. And then you will be like, oh, I, I get it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and then and then you can you know internalize it and talk about it and, and mull over it. Um, I, I don't I don't know, man. It's it, it is really interesting because I think we we always do enjoy these Sanderson books more after we get a chance to talk about them. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm I, definitely like really positive on this book right now because almost almost ninety five percent of it is just this conversation. Um, yeah, and I don't. I wish I had a quick easy answer for like, oh the way Sanderson writes does X for me and not Y. Uh, and there, and therefore I, I don't connect to his books in a way I, I would connect to another yeah. author. I don't, well, I don't have an answer for you. I, I, I'm, I'm like I said, I'm not even willing to blame the author for this. This, this feels like it's the way I'm approaching these novels or the way I'm, I, I don't, I don't know, man. I don't I, know. I do. I do have a little bit of an answer, which I, I avoid saying this kind of criticism because it's, it's not, I don't feel this kind of criticism is usually productive, but I think I can't avoid saying here that like, when he starts doing the lengthy action scenes, which are frequent, <laughs> uh, my eyes kind of glaze over, and and I just go into kind of a very passive like I'm I'm watching cart I'm watching a cartoon in, in my brain, and mm -hmm. and and then maybe there's a badass moment in there that makes me feel something every once in a while, but generally I, I just kind of detach, and then sometimes I don't sometimes it's hard for me to come back to the, to the same level of like, you know, it, it would be, it'd be like if ton of French or whatever had like a 70 page sword fight in the middle of her intricately detailed <laughs> detective drama. I'm just imagining what into the woods would look like with a sword fight in the middle of it. Yeah. Like, like your brain would just be like, what are we trying to do? Like, it would be very difficult to get back into sort of the mode of, yeah. Of, and because and because I agree like with with what John is saying with what you're saying here like the like he does have a lot of a lot of meat in, in his stories I would say more than more than the majority of the people operating his space actually in, in mm -hmm. the space of like high fantasy mm -hmm. um, it's not um, uh, he, he is he is beloved with good reason it's just I really do think that's a big part of it is that like I get kicked I get kicked out of the groove of thinking analytically and then I sometimes take too long either take too long to go back into the groove or if the book is short uh maybe never go back into the groove yeah speaking of which i really like the story better when it was just called the emperor's new groove <laughs> yeah me too yeah um john says the answer here is for us to do a chapter by chapter podcast analyzing all his books i mean like the thing is i think actually I, we're not going to do that but let me just let me just say that right here at front before i say what i'm going to say <laughs> I think actually that would work with Sanderson. Like I, I think as Matt and I have done this for years and years and years, I've kind of gotten to the point where I'm like, you know, this format wouldn't work for every author. I really don't think it would. Um, I do think it would work with Sanderson though. The more, the more I have these conversations, the more I'm like, yeah, I think you could probably pull enough content out of a really close read type of show on Sanderson specifically. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, like I'm, I'm thinking about like, you know, Shallon, AKA Shallon, um, and how like <laughs> maybe if I had doing, been doing a week to week close reading, I wouldn't have just completely whiffed on like all of the interesting stuff that was going on with that character. Um, but because I was just kind of in, in like, like death March mode, just going through the book quickly. Um, I, I definitely did not catch it until it was kind of like, here, here, Matt. It was, it was there the whole time. Mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. just didn't notice it because you're an idiot. Yeah. And and then and then you get it and you're like, oh man, that's awesome. Um. So, anyway, yeah, yeah. somebody should do that. Not me though. Yeah, I will. Uh, I will listen for sure. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. We we don't have time to do that. We got the stand to read. Yeah, we do. 
Um, okay, let's. Uh, we're getting near the end here, so I think let's let's open it up to you know Q and A and just more. I, the whole thing has been Q and A in general chat, but uh, yeah. let's just anything else that y'all specifically wanted to to pluck out of the story that maybe we didn't give an appropriate amount of time to. Um, speak now or forever all your peace. And while you're doing this, I'm going to be tabulating uh, the final vote. So if you have not voted in the straw poll uh, for next month's book club, now is the time to do it. Uh, Cause we're about to find out what book, Oh, you know, I did this totally out of order. So, you know, I, I see the Bishop commented that uh, Elantris and the emperor's soul are, are on the same planet, but on different continents. So there's just like, very it's um you know very very tenuous connection um, yeah i read i read specifically that uh sanderson said you uh, not at all have to have read the other book to understand this one which i mean i i guess i proved true by reading it and but, and under, and not having any any specific like hey what's going on in the world here questions i i will say it is interesting and i think this is part of Sanderson kind of trying to write a short, shorter story. It is interesting to me how we only see glimpses of the world itself. Um, we don't really see, like, I feel like a lot of Sanderson novels really center on the, the specificity of exactly how the government works in both, in both layers of how the government presents itself to working and then how the government really functions that he likes. Like I, I'm in, I think both Mistborn and Stormlight Archive and, and Warbreaker, there's a lot of pages devoted to exploring that idea. I'm not saying it's not in this book, but it is like kind of just, you get it like a vague under vague notion of it and not really any kind of specificity. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, that was one area where he did not get carried away. You know, it's like yeah, there's arbiters, yeah. there's factions, there's an emperor. I, I honestly think I probably just like filled in blanks with my imagination. And, and then now that's my head canon, And I don't even know where the line is between what the book actually says. And because like I have this I have this mental image of it being very like Roman. And it's probably because I just watched Gladiator and not actually because the book wants you to think that it's Roman in any way. Yeah. Who knows though? <laughs> yeah, no, I get that. I get that. What's up doom. Um, there's the link for you right there. You were just on time. I was just about to close it. Uh, all right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think I, I do think y'all for the sake of not having the same conversation over and over again, um, I think we're going to probably take a break from Sanderson on book club. I certainly definitely want to read the, the next two stormlight books. I said that after we finished the second one and I liked it a lot. Um, but uh, I think for, for ourselves and for not feeling like a shitty person, every time I come to these book clubs, I think uh, we're going to take a little break. The, the length is a factor as well. Like it's just, it's Very just a, uh... Very true. Hard. It's just hard to read that much in a month. That is true. This was th yeah. this was not hard to read at all. This was it was not really quick. Yeah. All right. Um. So we are going to close the poll, and it looks like the winner. You know, I actually um the the winner. I didn't update this. So pretend it doesn't say Friday, July 29th. Pretend it instead says. Friday, August 26th. Woo! Okay. Um, but the book... <laughs> Someone on Doom's Wi-Fi already participated in the vote. I didn't know there were... <laughs> oh, see, I didn't know that. I didn't know about the two. Okay. That's news to me. Okay. Well, uh, the winner is Project Hail Mary, which is the Andy Weir book. Huh. Um, Matt, had you read this one? I couldn't remember. No, I had never heard of this one. You really? You loved The Martian. I did love The Martian. I heard I heard mixed things about one of his other books, and then I was like, I guess I uh, don't need to. And then and then my brain stopped working. Yeah, sure. Um, well, you get an opportunity to revisit Andy Weir. Uh, it won by six votes. Actually, it was not close. Um, the vote in on the Patreon was one vote, and then uh, our straw poll pollers. Uh, it outvoted it. It outvoted the blade itself by five. So, yeah, it was not not close. Cool. Um, it seems to be. I just looked it up. It looks very up my alley. <laughs> yeah. 
Very much That's why so. I put it on the poll, Matt, because I said uh, Matt's going to like this. I think this is actually perfect because did I did I accidentally do this? I think we might have accidentally done that. I think we're approaching the five-year anniversary of the book club, and the first thing Matt and I ever did in recording was record an episode talking about The Martian, um, which we deleted and threw in the trash can, and you will never hear because we didn't know what we were doing. But that seems like if we're if we're about to hit year five of book club, that's like a beautiful coming full circle moment. Yeah. And I didn't even do it on purpose. Is it true that we just don't have that episode anymore? I kind of hope so, but I'm just curious. Um, I mean, we never published it publicly. We literally just you yeah. and I talked about it, and then I sent you the audio files and said, "Okay, this is bad, but do we want to do it again?" Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, no, that's fine. I, I look forward to that. Yeah. So that will be Friday, August 26th, not Friday, July 29th, because that's right now. Um, we will be meeting to discuss Andy Weir's Project Hail Mary. I'm looking forward to that. Um, before we go here, I just want to say thank you to everyone in the chat. Um, you know, I think y'all were more key to this discussion than ever before. Um, and I thank you once again for, you know, picking up my slack and helping me appreciate this book on a level that I clearly did not going into it. I'm not going to I'm not going to say that actually I love this book now. I still think there are problems with it, but um, it's one of those things where really getting to talk out the intricacies of what it's doing made me appreciate it more for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and of course, we just don't talk about the parts that are annoying to us. And that also makes us feel better about it. But I agree with you. You, you did not pile on. You were, um, you, you were, you were helpful. Thank no, y'all were extremely helpful. No, yeah, I think you were v extremely patient with us and very helpful. So, um, do masks. Are you guys listening to just King things? I don't know what doing a Stephen King podcast does to your opinion on the Stephen King podcast. Uh, I am not listening to that one. I listen to King Cast and I listen to the Losers Club on occasion. I don't listen to either uh, every week. But uh, I honestly. Is this heresy to say, Matt? I don't listen to podcasts that much anymore because I work from home, and so my big podcast time was commuting, and I don't do that right now. I listen to. It seems like a lot of the ones I used to listen to have sort of jumped the shark, and so I don't listen to them that much. And then I haven't picked up new ones, and I don't listen to Stephen King podcasts because the whole gimmick of Kingslingers is I'm trying to, you know, be the fresh the fresh eyes, so yeah. I don't want to be spoiled on things. Um. So anyway, I definitely don't. But, uh, yeah, sorry, I just read what John said. Someone told me that Brandon Sanderson is Mormon anime and it made so many things click for me. That explains everything, John. It explains everything. Uh, it all perfect. makes sense. Yeah, um, it's it's like a puzzle falling into place. Yeah, yeah it was great seeing you too, Jay. It, it had been a while, so I'm glad we got to hang out and chat for a little bit. Um, yeah, yeah, thanks, everybody. <laughs> sorry, Kyrgyzstan. <laughs> Uh, we're probably going to be doing more Stephen King, too. We can't stop. It's it's unhealthy. But uh, all right. I think that is going to do it for us this month. Uh, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, so much. We really appreciate it. We love having y'all here. We love uh, having y'all improve these books for us. That's why we do this. That's Again, I have to say, there. we could just record this, Matt and I, talking for an hour and a half, and it would be a very different show. We specifically want this to be a live stream thing. We specifically want this to be an interactive thing, and you guys make that possible, and we can't thank you enough for it. So thank you so much. Uh, if you're listening to the audio version of this after the fact, y'all got to come out next time. Look at how much fun this was. At, be here the 26th of August, 9.30 right. p.m. Central Time. Come on. Be here. Yes. It's the best. It's mm -hmm. the best. It's one of my favorite things that we do. Yeah, me too. We've once again avoided, avoided the reverse doof, yeah. The reverse doof, it, by the way, is when you like something less after hanging out with us talking about it, which has never, ever, ever happened. Yeah, I don't think it's ever happened to me. <laughs> cool. Um, all right. Well, um, if you like what we do here at Doof Media and you want to see more of it, then please head on over to our Patreon at patreon.com slash doofmedia and consider donating to support our organization. At any available level, you'll get access to vote for the books that we talk about each month as well as a bunch of other cool features. Check it out. That is right. And as always, if you have any questions, comments, or complaints, or just 
uh, want to send Brandon Sanderson to beat us up, you can reach out to us via email at doofmedia at gmail.com or over on our Twitter account at doofmedia. I just want to say that I follow Brandon Sanderson on Twitter, and I uh, when he makes posts where he does his own personal reviews of movies or books that he's read, I watch those very, very interestingly because I think he has a very interesting take on other people's art. I really, I really enjoy seeing him dis- discuss and talk about those things, so... I, I do not dislike Brandon Sanderson as either a person or an author, is what I'll say. No, he's a really smart guy, for sure. He, he absolutely is. He understands story more than a lot of people I've listened to. So it's pretty, it's pretty great seeing him talk about it. All right, folks, that is it for us this month. We will see you next month for Project Hail Mary with Mr. Andy Weir. We're just going to close the episode with Matt clinking ice in his cup. <laughs> <laughs> How much money did Brandon Sanderson end up pulling in on that uh, that fundraiser Let's thing? Let's see. It was even more than... It was something just um, absolutely uh, insane. It's Kickstarter. Four secret novels. Millions of dollars. It was... It was... It was... $41.7 million. I bet we could do better. <laughs> that's... That's like... It's like half as much money as everything, everywhere, all at once made in the box office. I know. And he's just like, hey, I'm going to release these books. Want to give me some money? And everyone's I already like, wrote them. Yup. <laughs> You're not even paying me to make them. I just, yeah. yeah. I just need help distributing them. Please give me yeah. money. And yeah. everybody did. Good for him. Good yeah. for the publishing industry. This is The publishing industry needs stuff like this because it's it's rough out there. It's really rough out there. Mm-hmm. Um, my, my mic volume goes up and down during the book club because I do the thing I'm not supposed to do, which is I turn my head to the side and don't talk directly into the mic because I'm looking at chat because I need to redo my entire setup. So my chat is at a place where I don't have to turn my head the whole time to read chat while I'm reading the thing. Uh, that's why. Usually gets fixed up in the final, in the final, um, it gets balanced a little bit, but it'll never be perfect. Yeah. Um, so in a perfect world, I have one monitor here and then I have a vertical monitor here with my chat on it. And then I have another monitor here. That's just doing stuff that I don't have to look at very often. Yeah. Um, that's why that's, it's usually not a problem on any of our other podcasts because on other podcasts, my script is right here and I'm just looking at it the whole time. And I don't look at this monitor at all. So that's why first rule of podcasting. Don't turn away from the mic when you're talking. Don't do it. It's bad. And I do it all the time. I Sorry only do it on that. this show because I have the same problem as you. I have the yeah. chat over there. Yeah. Well, the problem is like here's where I, here's where I really want the chat to be. I want the chat to be right here. But as you can see on your screen, that presents a little bit of a problem. Yeah. And it's hard. It, there's too much stuff. There's too much stuff. I try to cock my head so that I'm still talking into the microphone, but then I look yeah. like a velociraptor. Here, here's what I'll do from now on. I'll just go. Hello, chat. Hello. 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 Yeah, I mean, our setup is literally like five years old from when I had no idea what I was doing and was just setting it up. So there's like 7,000 ways I could fix it. But the problem is like also it's not just that y'all see it. It's that I need to read it as well. Mm-hmm. Um Oops, and I just minimized everything. So, hey, look, it's my desktop. Um, so yeah, no, the, we've got we've got to do a bunch of work in our whole our whole setup, but uh, that's that's for another day. Um, we're gonna go ahead and and get out of here. I uh, hope you guys enjoy your weekend, and uh, and we'll see you next month. Thanks for hanging out as always, and uh, we'll see you on the internet. That's right. Bye bye. <laughs> bye guys. <laughs>